it's sort of our approach to epistemology, the way that we come to knowledge, the way that we assess whether or not we actually know something that is true and real. And I'm going to be um, using the light course, which is a lecture series done by Rudolf Steiner. And it's read in audio form by Dale Brunsvold. And he's he goes pretty deeply into it. Um, this is really an approach to our psychological nature to nature, primarily through science, or what we consider to be science. And I'll just let I'll just let it go on. You can kind of like hear what what Steiner is saying, and you got to track with it, follow it for a minute, and then I'll break it down part by part. Okay, here we go. We can measure these possible effects by all sorts of procedures, and we can also express in measurements how strongly such a point can act. In general, when forces that can act when we fulfill certain conditions, are concentrated in a given point, we call the measurement of the forces concentrated there the potential, the potential force. Thus we can also say that when we study natural effects, we are intent on pursuing the potentials of central forces. We go toward certain middle points in order to study them as the point of origin of potential forces. This is basically the path taken by the particular direction of natural science that would like to transform everything into mechanics. It searches for the central forces, or better, the potentials of the central forces. By taking the important step into nature itself, is a question of clearly realizing that you cannot understand a phenomenon in which life plays a role if you proceed only according to this method. Okay, here what Steiner is trying to say is that our scientific approach, what we consider to be the scientific method, uh, almost exclusively since uh, the Newtonian paradigm, has been really the measurement of effects that we sense in nature. So the first problem is we're relying on our senses. And the second problem is, is that we are assuming that what we see is actually what's happening. And we use measurement and rationalism, reductionist materialist thinking in order to create a language which most of the time we use math as a language or geometry as a language in order to ascertain what is really going on. The problem here and what he's getting at is that if your approach to nature is not actually what's happening, it's just your perception of what's happening, then you're always going to be starting off um, in a place of falsity and so every paradigm that you build from that point is going to be incorrect okay moving on if you only search for the potentials of central forces if you are studying the play of forces in an animal or plant embryo you will never succeed but in fact the ideal of modern natural sciences is to study organic phenomena through potentials, through central forces of some description. It will be the dawn of a new world view in this discipline when we arrive at the realization that the pursuit of such central forces will not work to study phenomena in which life plays a role. And why not? Well, Let's imagine, for the sake of simplicity, that we wanted to study natural processes by physical experimentation. We go to the centers and study the possible effects that can emanate from such centers. We find the effect. Thus, when I calculate the potentials of the three points, A, B, and C, I find that A can affect alpha, beta, gamma. Likewise, C can affect alpha 1, beta 1, gamma 1, etc. I would then get an idea of how the effects of a given sphere play out under the influence of the potentials of certain central forces. Using this method, however, 
I will never be able to explain anything in which life plays a role. Why? Because the forces that are involved in life do not have potentials and are not central forces. Okay, pretty pretty powerful statement here. What he means by central forces are uh, basically the potentials or effects that we think are central to nature. And the problem with reductionism and using a description of the world like mathematics to claim that if it works with numbers that it's going to work universally is a false paradigm. Now, most mathematicians will argue that till the end of time. And there are some, I understand there are some cases where numbers are just rudimentarily, you know, fact an accurate description of nature. I agree with that. But when man starts to manipulate numbers into creating a description of the world based on his assumptions of what he's seeing, then those numbers become totally abstract. It's an abstraction. They become arbitrary. And, well, yeah, that's what he's getting at. So it's important to know that. It's important to know that if our initial hypothesis is a limitation where we're just measuring a certain portion of reality and describing it, well, that portion is never going to be uh, universally sound. So in this thing that, that Steiner has put together, the, the light course, it teaches you how to think incredibly objectively and look at things in nature and try to assess what is actually there in the moment without creating a description of it, without coming from a sense of belief, but really just connecting with it and observing what is actually happening in the physical world, physical and natural sciences. Thus, if you were to try in this case to find in D the physical effects under the influence of ABC, you would be able to go back to the central forces. If you wanted to study the effects of life, however, you could never say this, because there are no centers A, B, C for life effects. Instead, you can understand the situation correctly only if you say, quote, in D, I have life, close quote. Now, I look for the forces that have an effect on life. I cannot find them in ABC, and not even if I go further, but only if I go more or less to the end of the universe, in fact, to its entire surroundings. In other words, starting from D, I would have to go to the end of the world and conceive that forces are acting inward from every point in the sphere, coinciding in such a way that they all come together in point D. Thus, it is the complete opposite of central forces which have a potential. How could I calculate potential for something that acts from all sides from the infinity of space? It would have to be calculated by dividing the forces. I would have to divide a total force into smaller and smaller parts as I came closer to the edge of the world. The force would fragment Every calculation would fragment too, because in this case universal forces, not central forces, are at work. That is where calculations cease. And that is, once again, the leap from lifeless nature into living nature. Here he's putting forth the main point, I think, that you can take from this, is that is that science is constantly uh, leaving out the most important Important and crucial part of its its whole search and that is universality if you find something happening in nature and it's variable like for example your weight changes you know uh, if you're on a mountain your weight changes uh, if you are uh, by the sea your weight's different um, same with planets same with the movements of planets same with our idea of gravity 
actually all almost all of our atomic and Newtonian physics is just farcical when you really use your common sense and think about it. And um, so what he's pointing at here is that if you're measuring things in nature with your your sensory uh, instruments and you're not getting universals, then what you're measuring is actually not life. And so that's why he's saying that you're just measuring potentials or you're just measuring um, some some symptom or some form of abstraction that nature expresses, but it's not where life is playing a role. It's basically your own um, reality tunnel or your own reality filter, um, and you're upholding it with your own your own view. And there's nothing wrong with that. We all do it. I mean, we all speculate on what the hell's going on in the world. But Rudolf Steiner really goes deeply into how our thinking and how our syntax and how our, yeah, basically how our approach is dictating what we see in nature. And that is um, rarely correct. We can find our way to a real study of nature only when we understand first the leap from kinematics to mechanics. And when in turn we understand the leap from outer nature to something that can no longer be arrived at through calculations because every calculation fragments and every potential disintegrates. By this second leap, we pass from outer inorganic nature to living nature. And then here, I'll just, I'm going to use a clip from a video that I made already that talks about the same thing um, by R.A. Schwaller de Lubix, the, the great Egyptologist, esotericist, philosopher, mathematician as well, number theorist, among, amongst many other things, where he, he breaks down the psychology of the materialist, reductionist, approach to nature and just really points out how false the paradigm is. So here's R.A. Schwaller de Lubix. The machine imposes the limits of its possibilities after having falsely promised to place itself at the service of man. But a time will come when human problems will again be raised as they cannot forever be avoided. These fluctuations in humanity's psychological historical History are cyclical, but the present crisis is particularly severe because the cult of intellectuality is in the process of reversing all traditions, obscuring and negating all the symbols of a metaphysics transmitted through theologies and mores. The impure can become pure through the process of elimination, but error can never be transformed into truth. A radical change is absolutely essential. Through the natural law of reaction, our thought orientation will itself create the instrument of its reversal. After the disappearance of the builders of Babel, the great questions will once again be raised. What is man? Where does he come from? Where is he going? What is it that animates him? He has a soul. Has he a soul? What becomes of it after his body's death? Is there such a thing as good and evil, which affects eventual survival? However, in order to grasp what life is, we must be clear how all calculations come to an end. Now, I have neatly separated out for you everything that can be traced from potential and central forces from that which leads to universal forces. However, out there in nature, it is not separated in this way. You could pose the question, where is there a situation where only central forces act according to potentials, and where is there the other situation, where universal forces are at work that are not calculable according to potentials? There is an answer to this question, but it immediately indicates what important considerations have to be taken into account. We can say that in everything that people produce in the way of machines, which are put together from natural elements, we find purely abstract central forces according to their potential. Whatever is found in nature, however, even in organic things, 
cannot be studied solely according to central forces. That does not exist. That does not add up. Rather, in every case, where we have to do with things that are not artificially produced by people, what we are dealing with is a confluence that takes place between the effects of central forces and the effects of universal forces. In the entire realm of so-called nature, we find nothing that is lifeless in the true meaning of the word, with the exception of what people produce artificially, their machines, their mechanical products. There are no central forces in life, and when you look for the effects of life, you will not find potentialities or central forces because all of life throughout the universe is centered. So that's correct. It is centered. But it's the entire universe. It's all of existence. It's, it's infinite. So it is technically the only universal thing there is. And so when we're, when we're measuring things and describing them with language, symbols, icons, numbers, um, instrumentation, tools. Um, we, are, we are constantly just creating more and more abstractions because we're actually not measuring the one thing, which is the universe itself. And so, of course, this is a paradigm philosophers have always talked about. How can you measure the infinite? Well, the answer is you cannot but you can still know that it's infinite and you can know that you are, um, you are it, you are in it, you are flowing about it, you are a part of it, you and it are actually not separate in many ways, but you have to have an awareness of this in order to do that. In a deeply instinctual way, this was something that was both clear and unclear for Goethe, for it was an instinct on which he based his entire view of nature. And the contrast between Goethe and the natural scientist, as represented by Newton, actually derives from this fact. In modern times, the natural scientist has studied only this one thing, the observation of outer nature solely for the purpose of tracing it back to the central forces and for driving out of nature everything that could not be determined by central forces and potentials. Goethe did not accept the validity of such an approach, for to him what was called nature was only a lifeless abstraction under the influence of this approach. For him there was something real only when, in addition to central forces, forces from the periphery, universal forces, come into play. Basically, his entire theory of color is also built upon this contrast. But we will come to speak about that in detail in the next few days. Just reiterating, there are not central forces acting. That's pretty much illusion. What he's saying is that there is only universal forces at play, or really just the universal force. And the main point here is whether or not you believe that or not, even with number, even mathematicians would take that, that concept and realize that that is where calculation ceases. And that's what he just said. So if you realize as a number person that there is a limitation to calculation, then you have to realize immediately that there is a limitation to your description of the world. There's a limitation to your your paradigm. Now, I'm not saying that numbers end. Numbers technically go into infinity. However, discerning with symbol and with numbers what is naturally happening with the infinite infinity of numbers, well, that is totally subjective. That's my point. That's his point is that you can come up with all kinds of theories about it, and some of them may be very close to being accurate. But I can tell you this, if you're using materialism, mechanics, or reductionism in order to find that universal, it's not possible. I especially want 
wanted to give you this introduction today so that you could understand the relationship of the human being to the study of nature. In our times, we have to devote ourselves once again to a study like the one we have carried out today. Because now the time has come when we have a subconscious glimmering of the impossibility of the modern approach to nature and some sense that things have to change. Now, i got to say a perfect example of this, of what he's talking about, is the total cognitive dissonance that we have today in our current physics paradigm when they say things like we've measured the uh, the span of the universe we've measured it into its end which is a totally it's a total oxymoron it's um, it's impossible because the universe for one is infinite and two if the universe wasn't infinite that means there's a barrier somewhere way out there. And if there was a barrier out there, barriers, by definition, divide one thing from another. So if there was a barrier on the edge of the universe, that would mean that there's something beyond the edge of the universe. Well, that means it's the universe. It's still going. It's infinite. And this is the whole point is that this is what you see when you look at nature without your personality involved, without your ego involved, and without your reductionist, atomic, atonistic, materialistic view involved. If you look at what's happening around you, there is no end. The sky doesn't end. The space doesn't end. As far as you can tell or we can tell, it's infinite. And it doesn't make sense that it wouldn't be infinite because if we're sitting here floating around in some sort of container, well, then what's outside of the container? More universe. This is the problem, like with the whole atom. You know, uh, the great Giordano Bruno, great philosopher of the Renaissance, um, you know, he, he discovered, or he didn't discover, he remembered and uncovered that basically in nature, all bodies dissolve by design. So that means all containers, everything that holds something, which is a body, it's going to dissolve at some point. It's going to disintegrate. And that's what, what nature is constantly showing us and constantly doing. Why is it doing that? It's because all bodies are temporary. They're illusory because they exist in time. Time is ultimately temporary for the same reasons that if the universe is infinite, then it's everywhere, always, all the time, constantly present. So there is no distance. It's always there. It's always here. It's always has been, always will be. Okay. People still laugh a good deal when it is said that the old view of things does not work, but a time will come in the not so distant future when they will stop laughing. A time when we will be able to speak in Goethe's sense, even about physics. Perhaps we will speak about color in Goethe's sense, when another fortress that is regarded as even stronger is stormed. A fortress that even now has begun to crumble. That is the fortress of the theory of gravity. In this area especially, new theories emerge almost every year that shake the Newtonian conception of gravity which relies purely on the notion that only the mere mecha mechanism of central forces should figure. Huge point. Steiner you know, knew this a long time ago. And uh, in the modern era, anybody who's listening to this probably aware that physics is having some problems right now. We have a lot of different models coming up. They're constantly creating new, new uh, what do I call it, drivel about what's going on in um, the materialist version of physics. But I won't go into all those, all that black hole string theory, quantum mechanics, all that stuff is, um, is, is on its way out, if you ask me. And it has been for a long time, and Steiner knew this because he was aware of the universal nature of the universe, no pun intended. So when it comes to gravity... If you guys haven't, anybody who's listening to this, check out my channel. I have quite a few 
uh, videos based on Walter Russell, Robert Otey, D.B. Larson, uh, W.C. Wright, Nikola Tesla, and all these scientists, uh, among others, were aware, for one, that the universe is actually not atomic. So it's not, it's not sitting around in some ball that's contained somehow. It, it, it moves, or its, its uh, appearance of movement is due to wave forms. So with the waveforms, you have no choice but to understand that, that the dominant force in the universe is the electricity, not gravity. And technically, what people are calling gravity in the Newtonian sense, it does exist, but it's not gravity in the way that it's described by Newton or Einstein. It's a whole different thing, and it's due to electricity. So check that out. Check those works out. Check those books out. Walter Russell, Robert Otey, Tesla, and others. I believe that especially today the teachers of youth, as well as those who want to have a hand in the development of culture, must create a clear picture for themselves of how the human being stands in relation to nature. The relationship of how man stands to nature. And going back to some of the great philosophers and psychologists, um, the most modern, Michael Tessarian, but he draws on a whole bunch of other people, but I got to give him credit for his, his syncretization of all these people. And he, he basically says the neurosis and the, the pathology that we see in our modern world of quote unquote technological advancement is not only sadistic, but its source, the reason for us going astray is based on our antipathy or fear of nature. And it's so obvious once you understand this concept to see it when you look at our science description of the world or our science paradigm. If you're constantly trying to break something down that has no end and you're constantly trying to force it into a box or end it, it's going to make you crazy. It's, going to, it's kind of insane, especially if you keep doing it. The answer is to realize that our connection to nature is, um, is only limited by our awareness of it. And our awareness of it, the more aware we become with it, the more in flow or in tune or at one we become with it. So there you go. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, I know it's challenging stuff. You can comment. People are going to always comment. But I would like people to share it if you have an interest in this stuff because it's time to really look at these things. And Steiner, Steiner wrote this stuff down 100 years ago, and so did a lot of other people. Um, so it's time, to, it's time to wake up. Let's wake up. Peace.